Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in. Asyadu la ilaha illallah wa asyadu na muhammadin abduhu rasul. Ma ba'd. We're uh, coming to you today from Muncie, Indiana. Anybody ever heard of Muncie, Indiana? Heard of them? We were over there with the Muncieites yesterday. And now we're with the Andersonites today. <laughs> It's kind of unusual for me to to actually have these kind of chances, and uh, especially here, it's very special to me because I used to some years ago be the minister of music in our church. For it's called Church of God, and its location you'll never guess where it is. Can you guess? <laughs> very good. Yeah, it's right here. Now all those years. When I was with the Church of God, I never got a chance to come. But then, for 11 years, I've been a Muslim. Now I get to come. That's strange, isn't it? Very strange. But at least I got now to come and see what it's like here. And I like it. It's nice. Very peaceful. Very quiet. And uh, food was pretty good, too. We stopped and ate. So to get started, what I thought we would do is... I'm not... I'm not real excited about doing what they call comparative religion, where, you know, you'll say something you don't like, and then I'll say something I don't like until somebody gets mad enough to do something stupid. So instead, it's better to talk about what you have and let people decide for themselves. I spent a lot of years in business, in sales, marketing, and what we found out is that usually if you talk about your competitor's products, or the trade-in that somebody has on a car lot or something like that, you wind up actually driving them right back to it. So it's better just talk about what you have. If they say, well, what about what I have? Say, well, you ought to know better than me. <laughs> it's yours. So then people have a chance to make a, their mind on their own. And you're not trying to influence people or you're not trying to trick anybody. You're just trying to bring what you have and let them make a conscious decision what they like. So, uh, first of all, we'll begin by mentioning that Islam is not peace, okay? I heard so many people say that, Islam is peace, Islam is peace, Islam is peace. How many of you heard that? Heard it? It's wrong, okay? It doesn't mean it's not peace, uh, peaceful, but it doesn't mean peace. If you know the word in Arabic language for peace, it's salam. And in the Hebrew, it's shalom. And they're spelled the same, the same letters look different because the two languages look different. But they're pronounced different because in the Hebrew dialect, they pronounce some of the s sounds like sh like that. So that's where you get the difference between sh shalom and s salam. But in fact, uh, because I'm a chaplain, I work in the prisons, institutions, universities. Uh, one day when I was in a federal prison, one of the inmates came by me and he said, Shalom Aleikum. And I thought he had a speech impairment. And <laughs> I said, Walaikum Salam. He started laughing. He said, you didn't understand me, did you? I said, what? He said, I said, Shalom Aleikum. And I said, well, it sounds so much like Salam Aleikum. I thought that's what you said. He said, I'm Jewish. I said, oh... So, alhamdulillah, and praises to Allah, that we can begin by learning something right away and find out what things that we already know. I teach the basic Arabic course, and it's very simple and a lot of fun if you know what you're doing with it. And one of the first things we do when we teach the Arabic language is we say, don't think of it as a new language and don't think of it as something strange because it will overpower you and you can't do it. But think about what you already know and use that. You already know how to make the sounds of most of the letters in Arabic, so why don't you use what you have? The first letter in Arabic is A, ah, and the next one is Ba, and the next one is Ta. But we don't have the next letter because we use a combination, which is TH, Tha. There is no letter Tha in English, right? So these are small differences, but they help you to start building right away. Likewise, when I want to explain Islam itself, I do the same thing. Take what you already know and don't try to mystify something. Don't try to make it overpowering. 
Because anybody that's a scholar in Islam will quickly tell you that it's so wide and so deep that you can't learn it all. Nobody can master the uh, the religion of Islam. Nobody masters uh, even any part of it because it is very, very deep. However, the concept is all we want today. We just want to talk about the concept and see is Islam peace and tolerance. What was the other one you said? Love. You stuck that one in there because in the original the email it didn't have that one. You're bad boys. You change everything. Anyhow, what I want to do is just explain from the point of view of like a teacher showing it in the first, the beginning, in a class about Islam, and then you decide what it is. And that's better, I think. So the word is Islam. It's an Arabic word. You cannot understand that unless you break it down. It has two ways to look at it. Because Arabic, like all the Semitic languages, it's a Semitic language, by the way. Semitic meaning that this is where Jewish comes from, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Aramaic, which Jesus, peace be upon him, spoke. All of these come from the same grandfather language. They're all Semitic. They're root-driven. They work off of two- and three-letter roots. All of them do. And you build with suffixes and prefixes and sometimes both together. And it's very easy to understand these languages because when they're plural, it's clear. Because always the nouns are plural as well as the verbs. Likewise, the gender is right in there. You don't, have, you don't question because gender is built in as well. So there's a, a lot of advantages of staying with the Arabic language if you know what it is. The next thing to mention is that this one could be a verb, because they're always verbs, but in this case it could also be a noun, depending on how you understand it. And that's where a lot of people get confused. Islam. Let's take the root. Sa sin, lam, min. Sin, lam, min. Got it? Okay, and it's pronounced slim or salama. From that come these five meanings, and they're they're... Uh, together. All five of these are together in this. The first one is surrender, like sweet surrender. You know the song? Okay. Next one is submission. The next one is obedience. And the next one is sincerity. And then finally, salam, peace. So we have peace in the word. It's there, but it's not the whole thing. It's only one-fifth. And the meaning is that a person is trying to have a relationship. So that's the verb. It's the action of the relationship that they have with Almighty God. They are supposed to be surrendering, submitting, obeying, in sincerity, and finally, in peace with Almighty God. Okay? That's the action. For one who does it, he would be, in English, if you have a verb, you put what? A suffix. Er. Right? Talk. Er. Walk, er. Think, er. Stink, er. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Get carried away. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> you, you, take, <laughs> you take a verb <laughs> and then you put er after it and that's how the English language works. But in the Semitic languages, it's a little different. Especially in Arabic, you use the letter mim or mu and you pronounce it in front or as a prefix. So instead of talk, talker, we'd say mutalk, muwalk. Got it? But now let's go to the Arabic and look at some of the verbs and consider the word sali. Sali means pray. The salat or the formal ritualistic movements that we do with bowing and everything five times a day. The one who does it, musalli. Now, in Arabic, they have a word that's, that we got a word from in English. Safari comes from the Arabic word safar. And safar means to travel. And one who travels, travels around would, in Arabic, be what? What would you, uh, remember the rule? Mu, put mu in front and then say the word. Mu safar. Got it? It's complicated? Okay, I'm going to come to the main point. Islam. Anybody who does Islam would be a a what? Muslim. Muslim. Now you know where the word Muslim comes from. One who does the verb of Islam is a Muslim. 
Muslim. And it's funny because if you don't know any better, you know, I was down in Florida and I was on a radio program and uh, after it was over and we were walking out of the area where they had the program and we had some difficulty with the person that had the show because they were misunderstanding things, twisting things around. But as we walked out, it all became real clear how much they really didn't know. They were just really following a script. Because they asked me now, are you one of those Islamics or are you a Muslim? Islam, ik. That's Latin. You put an ik at the end of an Arabic word. It doesn't work. But it just shows our ignorance. We don't know what we're talking about. So Muslim, Muslim is the one performing the verb of Islam. Now, I said it's a verb, but then I mentioned that it was also a noun. What did I mean by that? What do I mean it's a, also a noun? Well, I Islam as a verb means anything which submits to God, surrenders to God, obeys God in sincerity and peace, is doing that, it becomes a Muslim. All the creation, the universe itself, is doing what God wants it to do, right? Or can it decide, no, I don't want to do that today? No, it has no choice. Therefore, the universe in Arabic language is Muslim, because it's subservient to Almighty God, all the universe. Always was, always will be. But when you talk about the faith that came with Muhammad, peace be upon him, 1400 years ago, that's a noun. That's when it becomes a noun. And it's the exact same word. So you could get mixed up real quick if you started to say that, oh, that's the, when Islam came 1400 years ago, what about all the people before that? And logically, you'd have to say, well, then it's not a complete religion, is it? But it doesn't mean that. It means from the beginning. Meaning that Adam, peace be upon him, uh, according to, and I'm going to speak from the Muslim point of view, so if this differs a little with what you know, this is because of what we have in the Quran. This is, I'm not quoting from the Bible. Although that I will tell you right now they're so similar, you, you'll be surprised. Uh, according to the Quran, Adam is the first one that God creates, creates him from dirt, then takes his mate, Hawa, Eve, from his side, from a, a, a rib bone. Okay? They're living in the paradise. But then, they're told by God, don't eat from this tree, or this plant, or this thing. Don't eat this fruit. But, of course, we know what happens. Adam eats from it. Eve eats from it. And then they get in trouble. And then God puts them out. Sounds similar? Even the devil is there in the story. He's called Shaitan and not Satan. Satan is an English word that comes from shaitan. And if you think, well, wait a minute, how do you know that the Arabs didn't get that from us? Because that's fair, okay? I'll just ask you a question. Which language came first? Arabic language has been here about, mm, traces back about 10,000 years, and English goes back 900. The Quran was revealed before there was any English, so any word you find similar in Quran, logically... <laughs> predates English, so if you have it in English, we know which way it went. The shaitan or Satan comes to Adam, tempts him, he eats, Eve gets tempted and she eats. Did you notice a difference in the chronological order? Did you see the difference? To us it doesn't matter which one ate first because one didn't influence the other one. We don't have something that we're pointing back to Eve and saying it's all your fault. It's separate. What Adam did He's responsible for what Eve did. She's responsible for. So this is a difference more in philosophy than it is anything else. So then they both did the same thing after a period of time. They did something called repent. After they repented, God forgave them. And that was the end of the problem. Then each of their children born after that were free to make their own sins. And then they need to repent. So this capsulizes each individual and makes him responsible for what he does and not for his grandfathers or his grandchildren. So there is no passing sin down the line or taking it from somebody on top. It's all you. Each individual, what you did, that's you. And good you do is for you and the evil you do is also for you. And it's mentioned more or less like this in the Quran. It says, that on the Day of Judgment, each one will see an Adam's weight of good that they did, and they'll also see an Adam's weight of evil that they've done. So, but each person is responsible for their own. 